Okay, so welcome everyone to this week's PCDN Career Impact Chat with Abby Robinson, who is the acting CEO and um, Chief Innovation Officer, doer, leader at Atlas Core. And if I read her bio, the whole, her whole bio would be here for a long time, but I would do a short version. She was in the early Atlas Core class in class two, I think they're up to like class 37. She was in Columbia, so we can talk about Columbia. She's also an alumni of the independent sector NGEN program and the American Express Leadership Academy. Prior to Atlas Core, she worked at the Inter-American Development Bank in DC and Fundacion Escuela Nueva in, in Colombia, and also for the Campus Kitchens Project, DC Central Kitchen. She served on the board of the 1% Foundation, which is a group of people who are trying to share 1% of the profits from corporations to help build a more sustainable world. She also served as an AmeriCorps Vista volunteer in Puerto Rico and has worked across the island. And she has a Bachelor's of Arts in Communication in Spanish with a minor in marketing. I didn't know you had marketing there from the University of Minnesota Duluth. And she's also completed courses on fundraising and she speaks English, Spanish and Minnesotan. So we're gonna to have to ask her if she can speak Fargo, that's more in North Dakota. And her personal motto is make it big. And we're delighted to have Abby here. I mean, Atlas Corps, I often refer to it as a reverse Peace Corps, like the way the world should be instead of just exporting people from the global north to go solve problems in the global south. It's really bringing the best talent from around the world to help learn and also help address challenges in North America. So Abby will talk for 10 to 15 minutes and then like all of our sessions, we will open this up to a chat. This session is sponsored by the Rotary Peace Fellowship. So if you're looking for a great opportunity for full funding for masters or professional certificate, I will put that in the link in the chat box. It's amazing. The deadline is in about a month. So Abby, I will turn it over to you and thank you. And she's, she's calling in from Canada, the other part of North America. So thank you so much on the rainy day in Montreal for making time. Great, well, thank you and thank you all for joining. It is an honor to be here. I love the PCDN network. It's been such a valuable part of Atlas Core and also a great resource for me. And I'm excited to engage in the discussion. And of course, leading up to that, would love to give you some context and some just some thoughts to help guide our discussion. And uh, I think the, the first thing is just a little background on me and then I'll give a little context in Atlas Core and then how that relates to leadership. So uh, I think what's important to know is, I love how Craig mentioned Fargo, is if you've seen the movie or the TV show, I actually grew up 45 minutes from Fargo. I am a small town farm girl, a first generation college graduate who grew up in a town of 200 people. And I think that you can be small town, but not small minded. And that's true everywhere you're from. And just throughout my career era, and throughout my life, I had amazing people around me who just inspired me and just opened the door to the world. And I think that's what really encouraged me to explore, to travel and to see where my talents lie. And I also even think about my background and you mentioned the marketing. When I was in school, I said, communications, because I love it, Spanish, because that gives me an excuse to travel. And I actually added the marketing minor because I felt like I needed something tangible. I felt like that people were like, communications in Spanish, what do you do with that? But when I said marketing, they're like, oh, that's in the business school. And I have a feeling that there are a few people who are on this call that might relate in that sometimes you may take uh, an, an alternative path that is not so clearly defined. And that's okay, because that's what this is all about. There's so much in our world. and we don't even know some of that's gonna be invented. And so looking at where can we find those talents? Where can we explore them? And so that is what led me to where I am with Atlas Core. And I like to think of myself as an entrepreneur. So what that means is essentially, I like to lead and innovate and support and create from within. So I've had this amazing history of joining entities or organizations or ideas where they are in this launch stage. Like maybe they're a few mo months to a few years old. And I take that idea and that knowledge and that team and want to enhance it, make it better. I add processes, I help create connections and then help um, drive that vision. And I feel blessed that people have allowed me to do that. And I think that's really where I lend my talents. And, and I feel really confident in that. And when thinking about my current role, this acting CEO, so Atlas Core, we are a nonprofit organization. This year is our 15th anniversary, so big year, woo! Uh, and we were founded on the idea that talent exists throughout the world, though opportunity does not. So our founder, Scott Beal, who I'll mention in a second, came up with this idea while he was in India that we have Peace Corps, we have VSO out of the UK, 
what opportunity we have for people from other countries, for example, to come to the US and not just to learn, but more importantly, to share. So that's where Atlas Core came in. And it's a year long, essentially a year long fellowship where we bring individuals to the US. And the idea is that they join a team, whether that be at the American Red Cross or maybe a local organization in DC like Miriam's Kitchen. And they're there, they're learning and also they're sharing because people become a full-time part of a team for a year. And so they can really contribute and they really exchange and more important, they become part of that community. So it has been a, a wild, amazing ride. I joined Atlas Core in class two. And actually before it even was founded, I met a friend of our founders at a fundraising conference. I was working at another organization and for some reason his college buddy who was helping him start Atlas Core said, Abby, you need to meet this guy, Scott Beal. And I said, I guess I do. And it took us a year before we met at a conference. Scott popped into a room, we were both speaking and he said, hey, I heard I have to meet. I became an Atlas Core volunteer and literally it was Mother's Day 2008. I sat down to read Atlas Core applications and I received an email that said, Atlas Core now accepting applications for Americans to serve in Colombia. And I emailed and I said, I want to serve in Colombia. What do I do? And true to form, as any social entrepreneur founder will do, I got an email five minutes later that said, quit reading applications and apply. That was May. June, I had my interviews. By the end of June, I had my offer. And mid-August, I was in Colombia. And wow, amazing. And that has set my path. And I think about it, there are a lot of ways you can explore your future. I always say I have a master's in life. I do not have an actual accredited master's, though the fellowship and these other opportunities have afforded that. And, and I really think that's what it's all about, is looking at these opportunities, embracing, and the key is getting to know people. We have a saying at Atlas Core that if you want money, ask for advice. And if you want advice, ask for money. So when we reach out, we're, we say, do you have advice? And that's the same, I think, for finding a job is reaching out to people and saying, do you have advice? How can I do this? And, uh, and through that, you're gonna be able to make these connections. And so in regards to my current role is on February 1, so actually about January 1, we got this word that our uh, that Scott was called up to the Peace Corps and is their Associate Director of Global Operations. And with that, then was the call for me, I've been at Atlas Corps 10 years and then plus a year as a fellow, to serve the role as acting CEO as we go through this interim process. And I'm honored to do so from the community, leading the community, also fully transparent. It's not the role that I'm vying for. I'm great as a co-pilot and look forward to having a, a wonderful CEO over the somehow selected over the course of this year um, and then go back to my role more in the co-pilot. And I've really been able to explore and it's exciting to lead this team. And I think about my form of leadership in this entrepreneurial role is, is that inspirational approach and that humble approach and really looking to advance the skills, talents of others on the team. And I think about how others have done that in me they've identified in me the skills, the experience, and, and encouraged and pushed me and challenged me forward to leadership roles that I didn't even know I should have. And I wanna do that from within. And so that's what I aspire to do with our team right now. And I think that's what we all can do with one another. And with doing that, we're also being able to find our own roles. And I think of three key items, and I'm gonna put these out there and then I'm gonna invite Craig and Kata to lead us in some discussion. Three key tips that I challenge or recommend is one is the opportunity to get involved and get connected with people. So whether that be if you're employed at a current organization and looking at, are there additional leadership opportunities? Can you get involved in employee committees or can you volunteer for a project you might not normally be assigned to? Or is there activities in the community? Can you be volunteering? Can you be helping others? Can you be mentoring? Where are ways you can make connections and where are ways that times that you can meet people? Because that's what's gonna make, meeting people are what make the connections that open doors of opportunity. And the second is about being helpful and pay attention to details. So whether you are acting CEO, whether you are an intern, be proactive on how you can be helpful or go above and beyond. A simple tip that I say to I've supervised many interns is when we have a weekly meeting and uh, it used to be when it was face to face, but now it's over Zoom. I'm like, where are you taking notes? And if they come to that in-person meeting without a notebook, without a computer, or if they come to our weekly call and they do not have a Google Doc, I love Google Docs, I say, stop, you need to write it down because there is no way you're gonna remember everything we talk about and I just do not trust that you're bringing it in. And by bringing that, taking the notes, writing it down, you demonstrate the importance of that conversation. So write it down, 
get in the details. Details will never serve you bad. And the last is have fun. It is so important that you enjoy what you do, whether that be in a full-time job, whether that be volunteering, whether that be just engaging. And I love it. We have um, our staff meeting is every other week. And what we do in our staff meeting, we rotate who leads that staff meeting. And this week, we have a new fellow on our team, Vitalise from Zimbabwe. He just joined a month ago, but we do it in, in order of alphabet. And so it was his turn. So literally, after being on the team for about two weeks, we said, you're leading the staff meeting, which is jump up to a leadership position. So good job for him. And then we always kick off the meeting with, I call it a roll call question or some type of activity. He had a great activity. He said, everyone grab the first object in front of you. So everyone grabbed an object. And he said, we're going to go around and you each have one minute to sell it to the team. And it was an activity. It took 10 minutes. And it was the most amazing team builder because we laughed. We got to know each other better. We got to show a different side. And it brought our team together. And we did that for 10 minutes and then we got down to business. So that was just fun. And I know there's a lot of to-do lists and I know these virtual calls are all about the to-do and I am about the to-do. I am a bullet list, deadline, email type person and taking the 10 minutes to just build a little community makes a, a big difference um, for yourself, but also for your team. So those are my quick intros and then I would love to engage in conversation. Wonderful, Abby. Thank you so much. And I, I'm waiting for, because Atlas Core has been doing leadership and innovation and nonprofit training for your team. One of the great things about Atlas Core is not only are the fellows placed with organizations, but what is it? Once a month, you also have internal trainings where the team gets together. Um, so, so just a very simple question, and then I'll, we'll get into the, can you just make a little pitch who Atlas Core looks for, how many alum you have, how people apply, you know, their deadlines, and then and how you pivoted for COVID, just like a little pitch and then we'll get into the leadership questions. Perfect and great timing because we just opened our recruitment cycle last week. So apply.atlascore.org and we're essentially seeking individuals between the ages of 22 to 35. And this is part of our pivot. And I think someone mentioned this is so we have essentially two opportunities right now. One is our fellowship. And essentially that is 12 months of full-time service with an organization and due to covid we did pivot into what we call the blended model so in 2020 we had fellows start and they started virtually and so they started with the host organization served from their home locations and then i'm proud to say beginning of april we brought our first six fellows to the us in more than a year so kudos to those brave uh, social change leaders and to safety precautions and such. They arrive safe, they quarantine, they are ready to go and continue service. We are now placing for, we have July class this year and October class. We are planning for in-person classes to come to the United States. Um, so uh, that's one. And then the second, as someone mentioned, is the Virtual Leadership Institute. So we also launched this in November of 2020. And what essentially is, so the Atlas Core Fellowship has full-time service. And then we do what's called our Global Leadership Institute, which we've modified over the years. And now what it is, is three times a year, we bring all our active fellows together, either in person or a virtual, essentially like a three to four day conference on the themes of developing self, developing others and building movements. And so we took that Global Leadership Lab and turned it into this Virtual Leadership Institute. So it's all online, it's approximately seven months. So we engage about 50 individuals that we call scholars and they engage in about one call a month. And then they're also involved in peer coaching groups, which are groups of about 10 led by one of our trained volunteers. And they also develop a leadership project, which um, could be a new project, could be a personal project, something for their organization. And the idea is that they focus on that developing leaders, developing self, developing others and building movements. They're also developing this leadership project through these seven months. And most important core to the Atlas core model is that they are building community. So recently we were talking, we had a um, one of our scholars from Nigeria who was collaborating with a scholar from Iraq and they were talking about digital security. And I think that is just a great example. You have two talented individuals that most likely would not have met each other, but through that institute, they're talking, collaborating and helping build resources on the ideas around digital security, which is such a key topic. So those are our two opportunities. And that's what we're looking for, apply.atlascore.org right now. Thank you, so that was a great pitch and please share it widely. We'll put the link in multiple times. So I'll start with a question 
um, Alwal has a question. And then for anybody who hasn't participated before, you can raise your hand if you want to make a verbal or video comment or put a comment in the chat box. And if you have something controversial that you don't want to be attributed to yourself, just message Kathleen or I and we'll raise it anonymously. So we'll do my, actually, let's start with Alwal. Let's do Alwal, Katya, and then myself. So Alwal, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Craig. Great, great uh, conversation going on. Thanks, Abby. Um, so Atlas Core is, is really interesting for me. My colleague of mine just finished the fiscal um, fellowship where she worked with, uh, I think, an organization in New York. She is a youth peace builder in North Central Nigeria, and she went there. She had a really great experience. And I'm just really wondering here, yeah, because I feel like Atlas Core is doing really well in providing like this global talent to US um, US-based organizations, but I wonder if there are enough opportunities for um, African or Global South talent to be able to work remotely yeah, with um, US-based organizations full-time. So the best so the best of my knowledge, I think she worked with the organization in New York for about six months, and then she had to come back at us until the end of the Atlas Core Fellowship, I think. So I'm just really wondering what you what you think about like opportunities for, for African talent to work with US-based corporations like full-time, because I have tried looking at such opportunities and you, oftentimes they want me to either be based in, in the US or like have like a work permit or something in the US and other things like that. Then the second question I have is because I applied for the Virtual Leadership Institute in um, in December. That was more appealing to me because I'm not looking to to yeah I'm not looking to relocate out of Nigeria. So that was very interesting. But I'm, I'm most curious about the third part of that Virtual Leadership Institute, which is leading social change or social movements. Could you speak a little bit to that? Thanks. Great. Um... Excellent. So, well, yay to Atlas Core alumni. We we love them. And also, Nigeria is, I think, our number two country for uh, the number of Atlas Core leaders we've had recruited. So that is a fun honor. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is a competitive job market. And I think looking at Atlas Core, we have like a one to two percent acceptance rate and it is competitive. And uh, there's a lot of factors related to that, like finding the right organizations, finding the right match between skill sets and organizations. So I think that is is similar across the board, whether looking at Atlas, applying for the Atlas Core Fellowship or looking for a full-time job with another entity. And I think now there is a unique opportunity in that organizations in general are more open to the remote service uh, because people have been doing it for a year. Whereas prior to March of 2020, there, there was probably most likely a preference in organizations that we do in person and remote work is like something special. Whereas now remote work, we are structured this way. And, uh, and so when thinking about that, I think organizations are more open to looking at, okay, where can we find talent? And who is best going to fit those roles? And I think what Atlas Core over these years was, was trying to do is, is to bridge that gap of being able to provide individuals from abroad with connections, entities in the US to then increase the likelihood, the employability for the future and even the broaden the perspective organization, strengthening them by providing a different pool of talent. And I think, you know, this, the thoughts of how to look appealing to those organizations, I think is very similar to the organizations as well as to when applying for the Atlas Core Fellowship. And, and I'll say I'm specifically, uh, talking in the context of I'm thinking like a US based organization and definitely from the perspective like an Atlas Core hiring full time employees as well as fellows is acknowledging that we work very much in a US environment. And so there are US based dynamics that that really appeal to us. And I think about um, some of the tips that we give fellows as they're applying is we're like in your application, be very specific. So when it asks three skills, list three skills. And how would I do that? I would say social media. I've managed this many social media accounts or public speaking or saying fundraising. Like I've raised $5 million in US government grants. And, and so it's very specific. And that speaks well to a US organization. They, they do not need the, the three paragraphs of explanation. In the same way in the interview, that translates the same. And I've done a lot of Atlas Core, what we call our, um, our screening interviews, so our selection board interviews before they're matched with the host. And these uh, talented applicants will talk to me and, and they'll explain. And after the interview, I'll say, 
you have an amazing profile, amazing skills. Here is the tip. When I ask you what are three things you could bring to an organization, list it out like you would write bullet points. And I think that's what's really key is really like boiling down what are your strengths, what are your key accomplishments, can you add metrics to that, can you add, shape them so people can really tangibly see uh, because often there is just and we see this now, a huge volume of applicants. So being able to distinguish yourself in that conciseness and specificity is really valuable. Craig, did you mention um, if Olu has a question yeah, and then wanna, I go? Yeah, if you wanna raise Olu's question, then you go. Oh, Olu's question is here. Uh, no, I don't have it with okay, me. Why don't you um, raise so it? So Olu yeah. asks from New York, what do you typically consider in a candidate application? So, and actually, can you give us any metrics, you know, so connected to that? So are you getting, because you used to have deadlines, now you have more somewhat rolling applications. Yeah. So do you get like in a year, 10,000, 5,000? And then just, you know, so, and what, what makes for, you have the age category, what else makes for a really competitive candidate who is likely to get through the screening interview and potentially get a placement. Uh, great. Oh, and Allah, I see your question about leading social movements. I'm gonna, I'm gonna highlight. Don't let me forget that. Um, great question. So, one quick note: we have had in this recruitment cycle. If you go to um, Facebook.atlascore, Facebook.com/atlascore, or YouTube.com/atlascore, we've had two great webinars featuring our Atlas Core fellows and alumni. One last week and one this week that are talking a little about the application process and what they learn. So, I do encourage people to watch those, especially the one this week. There were a few alumni that talked about what they've gained and also their application process. So, that'll be valuable to check out. And we're thinking about metrics. We say on average. Uh, about one to 2,000 individuals start an application each month in Atlas Core, and then we're still at about this between one to five percent placement. And what's key with Atlas Core that people know is um, it's a five-step process, and this is all on apply.atlascore.org, in that there's the written application, there are references, there's what we call a selection board interview, and you need to pat, pass each of these steps before you get to week, what we call the semi-finalist stage. And at the semi-finalist stage is when you're eligible to be matched with an organization. And so unless you get to the semi-finalist, you're not even connected with an organization. And then when it comes to the connection with the organization, that's another decision-making process. And Atlas Core is somewhat separated from that. So we have our pool of organizations that are looking for specific skill sets, maybe specific languages, maybe countries. And they send that to us and then we do a matching. So we'll say, oh, here are five semifinalists that, that match your profile you're looking for, and the organization will then interview. And so that's where that match is really important, such as with if you're doing a full-time job employment interview. So the organization does the interview to see if this person is a good fit, as well as the individual, the applicant. We also think it is important it's a good fit. This is 12 months. So it is important that an organization and an individual feel like there's a real synergy and that that's gonna be a valuable experience. And so that's when, uh, when the organization then says, oh, I interviewed Abby and we wanna bring her on as a fellow. And then we offer, Abby, would you like to become a fellow at this organization? Um, and then Atlas Core does all the back end to make it happen so you can arrive in the United States. Um, so, so that's a key element of our process. And I think when, uh, when, you know, as I went back to those details, when, when looking through how to um, work through that, one, it's patience, and then two, I do encourage, we have deadlines and what they're called priority deadlines. We take applications throughout the year. Our priority deadlines really focus on human nature. And as humans, I think we relate well to deadlines. So this pushes people and then also gives us benchmarks. So if we say, I think about May 15th is our current priority deadline. Don't wait till May 15th because we are reviewing applications and it does take time to do one of these applications and to do it well. And we'll review those and then we'll start sending you out. But at May 15th, it's kind of like an internal cutoff that we'll be still receiving applications, though we have to focus on what's in the group so we can start the matching process. So um, that's what's really important. So I encourage you apply early, give yourself time to do a thorough application. Like our fellows often recommend, they're like, start the application, step back, come back to it, have someone else look at it, especially if English is your second language, because organizations, this is what they look at and they have not got to interview you yet. So you got to look great on paper, something to think about. Um, 
And then I want to touch on this leading social movements. So uh, excellent question. And when we talk about leading social movements, it is really this broad leadership aspect. So it is about really inspiring a team or inspiring people to embrace your organization or inspiring a community. So it's how to get people excited about what you're doing. And one of the key ways we see that is by storytelling. So we have this really great storytelling workshop about uh, someone who calls himself the chief storyteller, which I love. And so it's a lot about how, being able to express yourself or the story of your organization or maybe the story of your community or a social movement. And so that's what we really see in the, in the broader context. And really when you look at Atlas Core, what we're really trying to do is we are trying to develop the most effective social change leader. And I think what's beautiful about our model is we are not beholden to a specific social issue, a skill set, a country, or a region. We are trying to be universal, really matching top talent to great organizations. And with that, the community, it really is, um, it strengthens itself. And our real belief is that if you inspire an individual and connect them to the right networks, give them the right tools, then they can impact on any social issue in any country, in any situation. And so that's what we're really trying to do. And so even with the concept of like leading movements, uh, we it's that broad sense of some tools you can do. And, and that's really what we found is an effective approach. And it'll be translated different for any individual situation, an individual country or context, though these are kind of the building blocks to keep you progressing on that path that you want to achieve. I guess uh, I guess it's my turn, right, Pre? Uh, so I I have a but it let me time to think because I have a confession and a common question <laughs> hybrid. So first, the confession is on your three tips that I thought were great, um, and I'm I I resonate with a lot of what you said, like the the bringing the notebook. You know, I I love it or whatever it is to take notes. But I am old fashioned, so I believe in notebooks and notes and writing and different colors. Deadlines to me are everything. Like it's just I can't work. If you ask me something and you don't tell me for when, you might as well like not tell me. You you just didn't ask me. That so I resonate a hundred percent. But then there is one that I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go out in the open because I can't be the only one. So I'm not detail oriented by nature. It's not in my nature. I, um, as you know, I run the podcast. I do the whole sausage process uh -huh. of making the podcast. And, and I, I just misspell names. I, I may be dyslexic, but undiagnosed, you know, who knows? But fundamentally, my brain is good at seeing systems and seeing mm. things on the 30 foot view, but the little nitty gritty. And I hear, because we live in the career space, on and on, everyone is like, what are your qualities? Like I'm detail oriented, like perfection. And and <laughs> so I don't even know if this is a question, but it's like, how can someone, obviously I have nothing to lose. You know, I don't think I may be fired from PCN, but that would be more of a, I, I don't know, which is why I'm venturing out to say, in case anyone is a closeted, not detail oriented person, like how would you frame? Because I do have my other qualities and I, I am a go-getter. Mm -hmm. I believe in getting things done, but sometimes it's in that effort of getting things done that the details may not turn out as nice. And so my guests will come and say, like, you misspell my name again. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I read it three times. So that's the sort of confession and your take on like what to do when you know, there's some like unspoken things that people are accepting these days and how do you be yourself and still um, get selected uh, with this, how do you pair your nature with what employers and what fellowships want? And then the comment question is about, I think one of the things that I've seen throughout these 15 years of Atlas Core is something of my core passions, which is, the south to north or the south to south cooperation and i do I, I don't think i've ever said it but atlas core is one of the few avenues that people in the south besides traditional scholarship or uh, graduate education have to move from the south to the north um and i i think that's i mean i did the whole graduate school a student thing I got my scholarships and I that's how I got myself to Spain and then to the US 
it was super tough. I mean, it's really what I will, uh, was talking about when you're in Colombia, when you're in Nigeria, it really is so tough to go. Uh, and so my, that's my comment. I think it's just an amazing organization and service that you do to professionals in the global South. Um, now having 15 years of experience and seeing where, what happens to the so global Southern professionals that attend your program, what do the careers look like after the one year completion of your program? Great, great questions. Uh, thank you for those. And I say in the first, I commend you, self-awareness is key. And obviously, if we were all detail-oriented and all project managers, then our world would be very boring and there would be no vision, right? Uh, and so I think that is, is the key, is to be self-aware and then to build the team or to find the support to fill in the gaps. And and I think specifically, like, I, I was not a project manager, nor was I super detail oriented through college into my career. And I have embraced that role and slowly developed it. And I, I realized that it has become a strength. And so I think when looking at those details, one, it's, it's expressing that. And I have a colleague right now who actually said, uh, and, you know, I, you know, fundraising and grant writing are what I do in my, you know, typical daytime. And those do require, I mean, you're writing a term paper essentially. And so spell check is great, Grammarly. And I have a colleague who works with me and, and he has said that he said, you know, details are not my, my uh, you know, forte, though he's grown in that. So it's not that you can't overcome, but how do you grow? And then also acknowledging that. And I think also a key thing is when I talked about setting up those systems, one of my first job at grant writing, which I had really no idea what I was doing. And I remember my first grant and I wrote it. It was like beautiful. And I think I put like some screen beans in there. And I was like, I was like, oh, I made it so lovely. And my supervisor, Karen, was like, what is this? This is crazy. You can't submit this. And I was like, what are you talking about? And this was about 48 hours before the deadline. And she was like, okay, you see this um, request for proposal? You see these five bullet points? This is exactly what they want, exactly in this order. And you need to answer these questions. They don't want anything crazy or um, fabulous like you put in here. This is not a newsletter. This is a grant proposal. And I was like, like, oh, so I read it. And from that, the process we came up with is that when we have a grant proposal, we have a five to 10 minute conversation. We set the strategy. What are we asking? How much money? And then I write it. And that was a process because she was detail oriented. She got out that red pen and I learned so much from her. And I think that is the key is you need to identify, okay, what are my strengths? What are my challenges? And then how am I going to work with other people? Um, and then in the other, when it comes to South North, thank you for that. I am humbled every day when I look at these Atlas Core Fellows. And I have to share last week. So we have we have this great community. I think it's our number one, our largest country is Pakistan. And part of the inspiration is for that is the US Embassy of Pakistan has partnered with Atlas Core over the years. And so in 2017, we launched this partnership that I was so proud of, A, because I wrote the proposal, but B, because what part of it was that we provided what we called in-country incubator funds. The focus of the proposal was social entrepreneurship. So the idea is we were bringing Pakistani fellows, they were engaging in entrepreneurship type organizations in the US. And then we had a small amount of funds that they could develop projects and they could apply to get these funds to then implement activities back home. And one of them was called Caterpillars, which Caterpill Herds, which was the idea was to inspire entrepreneurship among women in Pakistan. And Hira launched it. And she has won some awards for it. And last week she had this um, virtual showcase where her participants who'd gone through this incubator, they do this, um, I think it's weeks, maybe a few months incubator, and they were showcasing their projects. And I, um, she invited me just to attend and watch. Amazing. And I think about that is impact in action because we have these amazing talented individuals in Pakistan who know locally what needs to happen and have these projects are getting it done. And by being provided this training that was inspired by the fellowship and a little bit of seed funding, it's multiplied. And so there were you know, 10, 20 additional women who are doing amazing things. And, and I think that that is the beauty of this model. And, and I think, wow, I'm humbled because I'm not starting an organization. I'm not inspiring you know, 10 to 20 Pakistani entrepreneurs, um, but here I is. And, by writing that proposal, it opened that door. And I think that is just a great example of Atlas Core in action. And, and that's what we wanna do, whether a fellow, whether a scholar, even one of our volunteers, like we are about developing talent and then sending it forth to multiply impact. 
Thank you so much. I'm going to jump in with one or two questions and we have about 10, 15 minutes. If others have questions you want to put in the chat box or raise your hand. So I, I could ask a million questions. I'm going to start with one more for you personally, then I'll go to organizationally. So, you know, there's a million books on leadership. I've read a lot. There's blogs, all that stuff. What have you found the most valuable leadership resource for you? So is it peers, a book, a training course? And then what's your biggest challenge or where are you trying to work on your leadership? Great question. Um, I will admit, I think the peers, as well as if you are able, um, a coach. I just think it's it's the wealth of knowledge. Uh, I do I do enjoy the reading, the short courses. Uh, I admit that sometimes, and especially I think in our world now, I understand time is precious. And so I am very much motivated by either courses or um, conversations that connect me with other people that can really share real time like this, this type of thing, or even like, I think about our virtual leadership Institute, as I mentioned, it's really focused on community. And so the idea of to be able to have a quick, uh, have a pure coaching conversation with my peers to me, that is the most enriching and the most inspiring, even as I, uh, discovered on in January that I'd be having this role of acting CEO. I initially texted three individuals within my network that I knew had done a similar thing over the years. And wow, those 30 minute conversations just changed my perspective, answered some of my hesitation and just really set me on a positive path. And I think what's amazing, those individuals have texted me over these two to three months that have been doing this transition and, and I love it. So I think that's amazing. Um, and what I think of a, uh, so I, I encourage everyone to find that um, and, uh, and, and build that up. You don't need to text them once a day. Uh, I mean, these individuals I reached out to, Maybe once a year. We we like each other on Facebook. We comment, uh, though we're not we're not calling once a week, and that's okay because we we know when we can help each other most. Um, and when it comes like a leadership challenge, trying to overcome, um, you know it it's one that uh, just you know developed as I, I would joke. I say you know when I made my New Year's resolutions, one of them was not to become an acting CEO, and and boom, here it is. Uh, and I think for me the the challenge that I'm looking to overcome is this, this sense of balance. Um, I am uh, very much a doer and I'm a bootstrapper. Like I am, I'm a farm girl, like we get it done and you get it done when you don't have a lot of resources. And as people will say, as I think the African proverb go, goes, if you wanna go fast, go alone, but if you wanna go far, go together, if I'm saying that correctly. And that is the key, and especially at the helm of an organization. When I was reading, leading the development process, um, department, a much smaller team, and it was much more like personal drive. At the organization, it's really about dissemination and supporting. And so really looking at how can I inspire the team? How can I be aware of how they're feeling? Um, and really challenging me to empower others feeling comfortable that their way of doing is also a great way that that I don't always need to be the right, because there's lots of rights in this world. And and then just uh, inspiring. And I think, you know, we use Slack. And so sometimes I'll just send a Slack message in the morning. Hey, how's your weekend? Or hey, thanks for helping with this. And uh, and that takes, you know, a minute out of the schedule, but that kind of stuff is, hard, is, is important. So that is really key, how I balance becoming from a very like individual leader to one that's um, inspiring a real full team. Great. So I will ask two more questions, but then we'll see if anyone else wants to jump in. So one question is, you say you have about a 1% to 2% 2 acceptance rate, and you're getting upwards of thousands of applications a year. So a, qu a question is, for people who either don't fit Atlas Core criteria or don't get accepted, like who do you see as your peers in the world? Like where else, where else do you encourage people to go? And is there like a global movement? I mean, like you said, there's Peace Corps, VSO, UN volunteers, but is there sure. some other kind of South to South or other kind of this, this type of model that you see out there? Yeah, that's an excellent question there. You know, there, there are numerous organizations in the space and I think, you know, uh, supporting one another is, is great. Um, uh, more the, the South to South, I know Global Health Corps is doing a lot in Africa, also Core Africa. Uh, if you look at Volunteer Group Alliance, which is a, a membership organization, organization. There's some really great volunteer organizations there. There's also Ayave, which very much focus on 
um, pure volunteerism. I think, um, you know, the, the fellowship concept maybe is a little broader, but Ayave has some good connects. Um, and uh, even looking like I love Rotary um, and even some of the civic organizations. So I like Lions and looking, I know a lot of them have um, entities or um, uh, community groups throughout the world. And while they may be focused hyper local, they often connect that international group. So there might be like a short term exchange or there might be uh, um, some smaller opportunity that could fit. So I think getting involved in those civic type of organization is really valuable as well. And I think in this context of the virtual world, it there is this huge opportunity. Yes, I know we're fatigued from the virtual and yes, the door of opportunity has been opened in a unique way. And like, I even think, uh, you know, I work for Atlas Core based out of DC. I moved to Montreal two years ago for my family. And so I was teleworking two years before and I, I did have that, that FOMO, that fear of missing out. And then everyone I felt caught up over the last year and it's, it's really opened the op door of opportunity. And so I, I would challenge you to look at, it's not about quantity, but a really quality experience like PCDN, like if this, this is your your community, deep dive on it and connect with people. Or if there's another volunteer um, virtual aspect, I think there's more of them coming up, which are low cost, lower commitment, as Alwa mentioned, you know, we don't always need to travel. So um, that's what, what I would recommend. Um, I'm gonna give about 20 seconds of silence if, uh, oh, William, you, you've raised your hand. So if you wanna turn on your mic and our video. Yeah, well, first of all, Abby, thanks again. I really appreciate this. It's been a great conversation. And what uh, and I, I have a greater knowledge of what Atlas does. So just thank you for what you and, and the group does as a whole. Um, one of the things you talked about was uh, working in high performing organizations. I guess my question is I'm about to go into a similar organization like that. And my question is how, in, I, I, and I, based on your bio, I understand you've been in some really fellowships, some really good ones where mm -hmm. you're probably in groups where everyone's just a rock star. I guess my question is, in those types of organizations where everyone's getting after it, how do you maintain that level of excellence while still remaining resilient and keeping that high energy? Thank you again. Oh, great question. Uh, well, um, one thing I, I think two things is make yourself essential and celebrate everyone. And when I say make yourself essential, that goes back to this like getting involved. And so be proactive, say, can I get involved in projects? Don't sit back and wait. Um, and it's not about, I was offering suggestions. Like if, you know, if you're in a team meeting and, and people are bringing up, you're not like, oh, this, 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 no, that everyone knows that's annoying. It's more of, hey, our organ, like for example, in two weeks, we have this partnership with American Express. We put on a summit every year. And so I say to the team, hey, can I have two to three volunteers who, uh, who will give their time to help staff the summit? And there's a great example of, or even before they ask, like, hey, Abby, I hear that summit's going on. Can I volunteer? And boom, you are essential. People are like, you know what? William, we're going to look to him. He always is there to help out. That's a great tip. And then um, celebrate everyone and celebrate excellence. Is, is In those high-performing environments, there, there is this level of competition. And, I, you know, I played sports. I am a big fan of competition. And there's also this opportunity to... Um, support one another and by doing so people see you as a real team player and that your win or my win is also an organizational win so don't look at that as like jealousy look at it as like wow how did you how did you achieve that and that's a great opportunity to ask that question and say congratulations and I want to learn more so I think those are our two really good tips and I am excited to hear how your journey goes I mean that wow off to the Pentagon so sending you the best because high performers and an intense environment I think you hit both <laughs> And, and, and William, I'm a professor at Georgetown. I would encourage you to, if you don't know, Kathy Kretman, the Center for Nonprofit Leadership. She's got a lot of wonderful insights. Phenomenal, um, phenomenal. Yes. She's the reason why I do a podcast at the McCourt School through oh the uh, yeah, Public Policy Review. Phenomenal professor. Send, send us a link. Here. Send us a link. Yes, yeah, send us a link. I yeah, want this podcast. Chat. And also, also, Mark Rome is a brilliant, you know, methods and all that stuff. But please put your podcast link in. Um, so Abby, I'm going to do one more question and then we'll see if anyone else comes in. So actually there's two parts to the question. So one, have you had any external evaluations of Atlas Core, either at the 10 year or 15 year period to say, like, this is the cumulative impact. This is the cost per fellow. Um, this is like the ecosystem building beyond the fellow level. And if not, like, 
Are you looking to do that at some point or have funds or talent? That is an excellent question and a hot topic, Craig. I, um, I'll say one thing we have that I think, uh, one is our dream is to have a more comprehensive evaluation and um, some steps we've taken toward that is so through, as I mentioned before, these partnerships with the US Embassy in Pakistan, in two of those grants, we actually wrote in a monitoring and evaluation consultant. And the goal of that was, uh, because we had such a large community in Pakistan, to evaluate some of that impact because they they were um, at a time like our, our five, at about five and 10 year for Atlas course. So we had fellows, but also people that had been out of the program. And then to use the format and the knowledge gained in the process to also help us um, strengthen just our general assessment. And and so we did, we did learn and it, we did, you know, what we saw from that in analyzing these Pakistani participants was that people a, had a positive experience. They were getting advanced leadership positions going home. They were, um, they felt like they had a higher profile amongst their peers. So all positive on that front. And then we developed some of the tools that we're now using as some of the consistent assessments we use for like scholars or the fellows to kind of track over time. Uh, so I think we, we have a solid structure that kind of, that M and E can always be more robust, um, though that that was a, a, po a positive step for us. Um, so, and then one other question for people, whether they're just entering the workforce or mid career, what are the skills that you see are the trends or the sectors or the areas where there's going to be a lot of growth and the need for particular talent? Because you, because you have a really nice kind of global view, because you talk to lots of employers, you talk to funders, you've got your fellows, you've got your alum. So like what you had like your top three list at the beginning of things, like do you have kind of, these are some skills people might really want to think about developing to stay competitive? Yeah, great question. I think the digital environment, being comfortable, um, just functioning in a digital environment, like you have the Zoom calls, and I mentioned we use Slack, uh, we, we brought on Slack, I think, two years ago when a, a colleague said we should use this. I, I was not an early adopter. I was like, oh, we, we, have, we have the G Suite. So I was like, oh, we G Chat and Slack, game changer. I love it. And so being open to that, and you don't need to do every social media platform. I do not TikTok. I, I rarely Instagram. Uh, it's more of just being really comfortable and open to that. So I think being comfortable in a digital environment, um, I do think communication is, is key. And so we, so much of what we do is write, written now, uh, especially with, when, whether you're posting a chat or posting a, uh, a note on social media or writing an email. So I think there is a new, it's like professional communications like 3.0. And so being able to be concise and clear when, uh, when expressing yourself, I think is really important. That really relates to the digital connect as well. And then the last piece, I think, and I love when uh, Kat was saying this, um, it's about project management. And I just see so much of how an organization is structured or what we do is a series of projects. And to be able to conceptualize how that looks or be able to um, implement is, is such a valuable tool. And so being comfortable with that and, and essentially being able to map out how things might look. And, and I really uh, encourage some ways to practice that. So for example, I know a few people on the call were saying, you know, I'm looking at making a career transition. And so to create for you a project plan. So for the next 12 months, this is how I wanna approach that, whether it relates to this, how many coffee chats I wanna have with people. These are how many networks I wanna join. These are how many uh, jobs I wanna apply for. Um, so put that into place, how you, how you might manage a project, uh, or even you know, if, or if in your full-time job, if there's different projects, I just think it is um, an unbelievable skill, and it's so much of how we operate. So being able to have some kind of project structure is is helpful. I think this uh, this is a, a an amazing final thought that uh, Abby le leave us in and an anecdote, and I'm supposed to close, but. We have our kid in an alternative education and they manage their agenda and they plan the day, the week and the month from elementary school. And that's how they, they self-direct their education because they believe that they call it executive abilities for the future. And as people involved in careers, we were like, we want that school. <laughs> we really, really want that school precisely 
to the point of Abby that everything these days is so project managed, even in, in your life, you could be more efficient. Speaking of career transitions, tomorrow, shameless plug, the Social Change Career Podcast airs tomorrow. And um, I interview someone who spent almost over a decade uh, as a nonprofit executive doing fundraising development and then started and founded two social enterprises. So it's a great, um, if you are in the midst of career transition, that's great. And lastly, I think Abby, you and I need to seriously consider getting into some TikTok activity. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but I really enjoy your conversation, how clear and um, what an amazing leader you are because um, sometimes like there's so many Zoom meetings and they blend into each other. And then sometimes it's like um, you found this like shining star that inspires you. And you were that today for me. So thank you so much. And, and I'm going to jump in with one, one last announcement or two announcements. So one is please check out Atlas Core, the Rotary Fellowship. Consider doing our 30 second feedback form next week. We do this every Thursday at noon. Next week, we have an Argentinian peace builder, former Rotary fellow from, I think, the first class who has worked for every part of the UN over 20 years. He actually works now for UN Women, and he actually is a Netflix actor, too. So it'll be our first Netflix actor. So his name is Bautista Logico. So stay tuned for that. And then the following week, we have a social innovator from UK, I think, South Asia. And then the following week, I think, an innovator from Zimbabwe. So, and if you want to suggest people join us, and please, Abby, thank you so much for taking time out of your brilliant wisdom. Even if you're not going to apply for Atlas Core, please share it with others. I mean, this because they really are amazing. And I guess my last question before we go is, have, I mean, has any donor ever approached you and say, like, what you do is so cool, like, here's money, or you always have to kind of reach for it? Because I just think, like, why doesn't someone just give Atlas Core a $100 million endowment? You know, so you could just, like... I like you could be, no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm not saying this because I know you, but like, just say like, here's a lot of money and build the world's best, like professional. Ex I mean, ISEC is a little bit like what you do, but that's at the student mm -hmm. level. But like, has anyone ever, yes. or I hope that happens maybe, maybe, you know, but has maybe anyone ever- this year? <laughs> You know, we always say Atlas Core was crazy, 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 obvious was how we started. People are like, that idea is crazy. You're crazy, you're crazy and obvious. Now we're at the obvious stage, like 15 years, we are obvious. And I would love for that conversation to happen. Um, and uh, A, no one has ever approached us, but B, I think people see the value. And I will say one, one of the uh, probably unique positions a leadership organization has is that we're, I always call us, I call us second tier, is that we are not that first tier of, we're not providing community health, we're not providing meals, we're not providing um, direct access to like basic education. Instead, we're empowering the individuals that are doing that. So uh, I, I commend those funders because I know a lot of funders that they, they're focused on those direct services. And I, I came from a hunger, hunger relief background, so that is important. And we're kind of that second level. So we have those funders that are inspired by the second level. And so if you, you know of those, you are those, please come to us because I think we can multiply impact. Um, so yeah, just the way philanthropy goes. So you know, we'll see how that changes over the years. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a safe afternoon wherever you are. Abby, you're the best. I look thank forward you to all. your TikToks. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.